awakening as a prisoner in the land of Tamriel. You'd be excused for thinking you were in the world of Skyrim. But eras before, another prisoner was born, the Nerevering, who was pardoned and delivered to the Isle of Vardenfell in the province of Morrowind. They were destined to unite the tribes of Morrowind, rebirthing the province without any corruption. Unlike many of the Elder Scroll games, which dictate a player's directions to the presentation of quests, Morrowind just simply lays in silence, waiting for the player to explore and uncover its many mysteries. Coupled with rich narratives interwoven to create a vibrant world, the story of Morrowind is one of the best in the Elder Scroll franchise. This narrated tapestry leads to much intrigue, with many events often being left up to the player's interpretation. It's been over 20 years since the release of Morrowind, yet still, the discussions of the game events keep enticing the tongues of many, with new theories constantly being formed around the Elder Scrolls universe. An iceberg chart is a format used to rank these theories and points, with the more popular and surface level theories placed at the higher levels of the iceberg. As we venture deeper down the iceberg image, the more conspiratorial and theoretical the points become. Today we'll be continuing our exploration of a massive Elder Scrolls iceberg. We've already covered the Skyrim and Oblivion sections of this chart, and at this rate we might finish covering this iceberg by the year 3000, and to do that on time, it's time for us to cover the Morrowind section of the iceberg. So let's trek the Red Mountain, and observe the vast richness that is the Morrowind iceberg. Pool of Forgetfulness. Just over the Red Mountains, near the gateway to the Ghost Fence, lies a small cave for the House of Dagoth, under the ruling of the immortal Dagoth Ur. The House of Dagoth's aim was to liberate mortals against their gods, liberating first Vardenfall, then Morrowind, and soon to be all of Tamriel. But they recruited people through targeting the poor, smuggling people, and weakened people through their dreams. Through losses in battle, the Great House Dagoth was reduced to rubble. To disgrace them further, they were silenced in the history books, only being known as the Nameless Sixth House. But in this cave, there is one sculpture of interest that remains. The Pool of Forgetfulness. The sound of running water against a frozen model, it's almost as if the developers themselves had forgotten about completing the fountain itself. This was actually an intended easter egg, with Morrowind having a large number of quite comical easter eggs, like the body of Piki Uchu, who hopes to be able to bring the reader laughter, being a reference to the Pokemon Pikachu, and personally my favourite easter egg, the body of Indiana Jones, found in the Omolom Ancestral Tomb, a rock has fallen on an adventurous leg, cutting short his adventures to retrieve artefacts and find treasures that were thought to be a myth. As for the Pool of Forgetfulness, it is most likely a reference to the Greek mythological river Lethe, meaning forgetfulness in ancient Greek. One of the five rivers of the underworld Hades, the Shades of the Dead drank the waters of Lethe in order to forget their previous earthly life. The sixth house predominantly has members that are ash creatures, like the ash slaves, who look like they might be deformed dark elves, the Dunmar. The Ash Slave is a humanoid creature transformed by a mysterious force into a deranged beast. These creatures are aggressive and dangerous. Ash Slaves are associated in some way with the Devil Dagoth Ur. A typical gamer girl supposes that this is what the Pool of Forgetfulness is a reference to. This could be a place where the Ash creatures, who had just started their new lives, need to drink the water to forget their previous Dunmar lives. Now we've gotten off to a great start by actually talking about a point that wasn't even on the iceberg we're exploring, so let's all drink from that fountain and forget we were talking about this. But while we are on the topic of the sixth house, let's take a small plunge deep below in the iceberg and extract one of the more peculiar Ash Slave theories, and that's about furniture speaking. The Ash Slaves are aggressive creatures, but if a calming spell is casted on them, or they are approached sneakily from behind, they can actually be interacted with. The chairs, the tables, all confused. We hear the words and must speak them. We 
take them and arrange them, but still they will not. Be quiet. It seems the furniture is talking to the Ash slaves, giving them orders on how to be displayed. If we look at the furniture throughout the sixth house bases, we can see furniture piled upon each other. A desperate attempt by the Ash slaves to appease the voices. Everything is wrong. This is not straight. This is too high. This is in my way. We must put them right. So are the Ash slaves really being haunted by the furniture within their homes? I think Southern Shadows disagrees correctly here and credits the voices to Dagoth Ur. The Ash slaves are confused by the words, thinking that it's the furniture around them, while it's really from their initiator Dagoth Ur, who reformed their physical body with their minds being filled with words of Dagoth Ur's design, slipping out of life and joining him as a godly being without death. The dreamers say, We do not fear death. Life is a dream. Blood is a dream. We sleep in one soul. The soul of Lord Dagoth. But many of the mortal minds, like the Ashlaves, can't comprehend the web of words uttered by Dagoth Ur. They begin to go insane, attributing their words to the inanimate furniture around them, and spend their lives rearranging them hoping that it will quieten the confusing voices that plague their mind. Helseth murdered King Lethen. The current King of Morrowind, King Lalu Helseth, was only recently appointed during the events of Morrowind. Helseth became king after the sudden death of King Lethen. May his spirit rest among his ancestors. We did all that could be done for him, but in the end he seemed to have lost his will to live. He was a great man, and we mourn his loss. It is never easy to assume the throne, especially after the unfortunate set of circumstances that led to our beloved King Lethen's death. There are those who would seek to profit from such events, to take the opportunity to create unrest among the people. There are those even who would wish to see us dead. Helseth alludes that Lethen's death was unnatural, perhaps even a murder. Unfortunate is an interesting way to put it, as if it was a sacrifice for a greater goal maybe. Lethen's successor was meant to be taken Vandas, his nephew, who strangely died in a hunting accident shortly before Lethen's death himself. So then the crown is passed further down to Helseth, the great nephew. It almost seems too good to be true for Helseth. So did Lethen die through murder? And if so, who killed him? Well, Morrowind does provide an in-game theory for this. Ravani Lethen, King Lethen's widow, is convinced that her husband was murdered. They murdered him, Helseth and his spiders. Everyone knows, and no one lifts a finger. Imperial justice? Ha! I spit on Imperial justice. They killed my husband, and now that wicked man is king. I curse Helseth and all his kin. May they die tomorrow. Weeping, watching their children die today. It's there in print for everyone to see. In the broadside sheet called the Common Tongue. It says Helseth poisoned hundreds of people when he was in the West. If Helseth was a wicked murderer before, why not now? The Common Tongue is a damning newsletter slandering Helseth, anonymously written by Trells Varys. Varys values the truth and states that it is the truth that he is printed in the Common Tongue. This unravels the suspicious and mischievous actions surrounding Helseth. At this time, Helseth was the prince of the kingdom of Wayrest, and was involved in a scandal of receiving bribes when obtaining ebony import remits. But the man who was testifying against Helseth, a Khajiit male unharmed, died a natural death before he could testify. How very convenient. Others who could testify against Helseth for different unceremonious acts, like the Breton Gisol Asili and the Imperial Martyrius Aruntius, all fell gravely ill before they could besmirch Helseth's name. Varys, along with others, suppose that Prince Helseth is one of the most accomplished poisoners in the West, with only rumours being left to tell the tale. Lethen, like others that were in Helseth's way, could have been another victim of poisoning, and Helseth himself does try to assassinate the Nerevarian multiple times, so I definitely wouldn't put it past him to murder Lethen as well. But now it's time for us to start our descent into the ancestral tombs of this iceberg. 
mud crabs are one of the most common and well-known creatures throughout Tamriel. However, there's one mud crab that we can find in Morrowind, which is not like the rest. And this mud crab is a gateway to many conspiracies. Located on a small island in the Azura coast, a mud crab can be found who may have had a bit too much skooma. What do you think? Sheesh, I'm a mud crab. Crab. You're a mud crab. That's me. Pretty sure. I look like a mud crab, right? Must be. This is me talking, right? So, I must be a talking mud crab. And I sell stuff, right? So, I must be a talking mud crab merchant. Stands to reason, don't it? Wait, a talking mud crab? And not only just talking, but also one that's a merchant. Sure. That's what I say. Did I start with something? Talking. Mud crab. Merchant. Read my lips. Uh, mouth part? Read my mouth part. Something ain't right. But never mind. Just one of life's little mysteries. So, you gonna buy something or sit here jarring all day? This led some to believe that all mud crabs could in fact speak and are a lot smarter than we realise. Maybe mud crabs are busy scheming away while making everyone believe that they are of low intelligence. Until one drunken mud crab in an extremely remote island spills the beans. Argonian Cow 77 believes that this mud crab merchant was not always a mud crab. The mud crab tells the Nerevarine to read their lips, before correcting themselves to mouth parts, which alludes that they used to have lips. Just one of life's little mysteries, I suppose? Nice try, Todd Howard. You can't dissuade us that easily. LBO believes that the ancient dwarves race of the Dwemer never in fact truly disappeared, but were cursed by a Daedric prince to become mud crabs. Mud crabs are first seen in Morrowind after the Dwemer have long since vanished. In Skyrim, the quest in New Order tasks the Dragonborn to retrieve Soren Jirar's satchel. This satchel contains dwarf Yaros, a Dwemer artifact. For some reason, she's suspicious that the mud crabs are the thieves. Do you think mud crabs might have taken it? I saw one the other day. Wouldn't be surprised if it followed me here. But just look around, will you? And sure enough, the satchel can be found on a riverbank, exactly where a thieving mud crab would store their stolen possessions. But why would a perceivably dim mud crab be capable of stealing a satchel? Well, if the mud crabs are much smarter than they appear, and they can actually speak, then they also could be able to take back what is rightfully theirs, their Dwemer possessions. The Dwarf's Armoured Mud Crab is a pet from Skyrim's Creative Club content. This crab, if seen as true, could be keeping the secret that the Dwemer are mud crabs in plain sight, with one of the mud crabs wearing their previous form's armour. But because this item is essentially a mod, it may not be entirely canon. Bethesda Community Content Manager Kato Griffey chimed into question as to whether the Creation Club content is canon. Creations are official releases, but it's also understandable that a site like UESP or the Imperial Library would take Creation Club with a grain of salt. We do consider law implications when reviewing proposals, particularly something trying to heavily enmesh itself into the world. So technically from a law perspective, we should really take this with a grain of salt and not use this as a crux to confirm the Dwemer are now mud crabs. There's one more voice regarding this merchant mud crab that we should absolutely consider, and that's of Maik the Liar. Maik has heard of this. They've got all the money. Mud crabs taken over everything. They already run Pelagaid. So a Maik fueled theory is definitely not the most reliable, but maybe the mud crabs are indeed taking over everything running the world economy. The Merchant Mud Crab is the richest merchant in Morrowind, even though they are located in one of the most remote and inconvenient locations to be able to run a business. So are all of these mentionings just fun easter eggs, or does it hint at a larger, more sinister system, lying dormant and secretly plotting away in the depths of the Tamriel world? Who threw Bardow? The Bardow was a celestial rock that was hurtling towards Vivek City, but was stopped from crashing into the city by Vivek himself. It then remained hovering over the city, as an ominous reminder to the citizens to never stop loving the tribunal god Vivek. Vivek was a warrior poet, a living god who relished in his own self-image. Living in Vivek City, the entire city was considered a holy place, 
with many worshipping him. Bardal became the Ministry of Truth, being hollowed out to house a temple, imprisoning blasphemers in an attempt to reform them. But in the fourth era, Vivek mysteriously disappeared, and the Bardal began to fall towards the city again. Many souls were captured and used to prevent the falling of the celestial rock. Many of those were sacrificed against their will, so attempts were made to free the enslaved souls. This resulted in the mechanism holding the Bardal failing, and the rock plummeted down to the city, leaving a massive crater of destruction known as the Scathing Bay. Tsunamis were formed which plagued Morrowind, and the Red Mountain erupted, devastating many. But why was this rock, the Bardal, plummeting towards the city of the Vec in the first place? Was it just the fate of the solar system, or was it a more sinister calculated move? Many think that this rock was sent with malicious intentions. The tribunal campaigned the belief that Shiagora threw the Bardal. The dominant religion in Morrowind, the tribunal, worshipped the goddess Amalexia and the gods of Sothasil and Vivek. In fact, the hollowed out centre of the Bardal ended up becoming a tribunal temple, as it was a great place of importance to them. They wrote the book The Pilgrim's Path, which describes the Shrine of the Seven Graces. The Shrine of Daring, to stop the moon, details that Shia Gorath had rebelled against the tribunal, tricking the moon Bardal into forsaking its appointed path through oblivion. The mad star inspired the moon to hurl itself upon the Vex new city, which Shia Gorath claimed was built in mockery of the heavens. A tale of Bardal states that Shia Gorath didn't actually much care where the rock was going to land, or whether it would cause chaos or not. But he was just bored, and plucked the mighty rock from the void, and flung it far, far towards Nern. Alright, so Shia Gorath is completely evil, and Vivek is our valiant hero, here to save us all. Praise Vivek! Hold on, this does seem a bit suspicious. The Pilgrim's Path was written by the Tribunal Temple, who worshipped Vivek, so you'd think they'd be willing to bend the truth in order to paint Vivek in the best light possible. But we also have a tale of Bardal. Who wrote that? Someone by the name of Emilia Drells, who we don't know much of, but this book can be found in the Elder Scrolls Online Morrowind at the Temple of Canton, which contains the Library of Vivek. And the ending of this book goes, a reminder to all, together now, praise Vivek, praise the three. Yeah, this is definitely heavily influenced tribunal writing, so these books can all potentially be incredibly biased. Could these stories just be hiding the real truth of why the Bardal lies above the Vivek city? Another Morrowind book found in Elder Scrolls Online, The Testimonials on Bardal, is a collection of interviews written to the citizens of Vivek city. Many rumours and fairy tales began to form about how the Bardal really magically appeared. Narcosuk strangely explained that Bardal is actually not a rock, but a giant hunk of dung. Vivek said something about ogres that called Malaketh to squat over Vivek city and drop a stick pickled rye on Vivek's head. A very creative suggestion there. Malaketh was the god of curses, and also known as the Orc Father, Morlock. The Orcs believed that Malaketh was created due to the warrior Trinomic being devoured by the Daedric Prince Boethia. But yet again, Malaketh is the Orc's god, so this could just be another fantasized story glorifying someone's god. With this magical rock just appearing over Vivek city, it seems that every individual wants to attribute it to their own god. And this could be an argument for why the rock was never destroyed, or made smaller while it loomed over the city. It became a sacred token to many. Sermon 33 from the 36 Lessons of Vivek stated that Vivek merely raised his hand and froze the shooting star, the Lyrock, rock just above the city. Well this gets a bit more interesting, the Lyrock. rock? What kind of lies could it be hiding? Vivek gave this name to the rock, so we can presume that the rock, or its intentions, had an opposite mantra to Vivek. Perhaps we could get a more impartial theory from outside of Tamriel. Pumpkin Panda believes that it was Vivek himself that threw the bar down. He did this to paint himself as a saviour, encouraging the worship of him. Vivek does state in Sermon 33 that for his retention of the magical meteor to stay steadfast, the love of the people in the Vivek city must remain, otherwise the city will be destroyed. This doesn't really seem like something a hero would do, leaving their heroic deed as a threat for his people to always love him, and a reminder of his almighty power. Shea Gorath was a very easy scapegoat for this atrocity, with it being painted that the cruel actions were being done by those that were against Vivek, 
The last dilemma thinks that the real reason for why the Bar Dao is over the Vex City is a combination of all the three theories that we've mentioned so far. Malakas excretion was used by Vivek as an intriguing piece to entertain Shiagorath, who hurled it at Vivek City upon request. Very far-fetched indeed, but I guess it's an explanation for why there could be many theories of the Bar Dao, if we were intent on keeping them all as canon as possible. Elder Scrolls Online could air some light onto this meteor and the egg conundrum, with Vivek explaining his Bar Dao actions. Did you notice that I haven't moved Bar Dao back to its original position? It's in no danger of falling, thanks to you. But as I wrote in the Ballad of Red Mountain, all actions have consequences and pose some risk. Best to leave it alone. Vivek says he kept it there as moving the Bar Dao could bring unforeseen consequences. Still, this could be yet another lie by Vivek, trying to cover his tracks. Which is why I personally like the theory that Vivek himself caused the Bar Dao to hurtle towards the Vivek city, exalting himself while condemning the lowly citizens beneath, and the tribunal dismissingly following his every word. But this is not the only questionable thing that a tribunal has done. It seems that the tribunal temple is also seemingly withholding the cure for vampirism. Found in Wolverine Hall, the Argonian skink in Tree's shade is the member of the Mages Guild and focuses his study on the dark afflictions of the world's just ash creatures and vampirism. He gives the Nerevarine many tasks to help aid his research, and one of the books is a second volume of the Vampires of Vardenfell. There are two books in this series. The first is Common and Morrowind. Most rare booksellers have a copy. The second volume is Rare. If you can find a copy of Volume 2, I would be grateful. It's a little peculiar that a first volume of the book could be so popular, while the second volume is much rarer. But bookseller Jabasha shed some light onto this. It is a rare book. The temple does not like this book and could punish Jabasha if they knew. So the temple has banned this book. But as for the first volume, one of the places we can find this is at the Gnisis Temple, a pilgrimage destination for tribunal members. So it seems like it's only the second volume of this book that has been exiled by the tribunal. I wonder why. The first volume of Vampires of Vardenfell describes the mysterious and sinister movements of the three known bloodlines of the Vardenfell vampires, with victims being infected, contracting a disease that is incurable and irreversible. But the second volume of the Vampires of Vardenfell contains anecdotes of individuals who have supposedly been cured of vampirism, along with an ancient tradition in the Temple Doctrine which believes that Molag Bal, the father of monsters, spawned the first vampire upon the corpse of a defeated foe. Now, some believe that the temple have banned this book due to withholding the cure of vampirism, which could indeed be true, but not as malicious as it first seems. Volume 2 talks about vampire hunters, who are primarily composed of formerly afflicted vampires who have been cured of the disease. But these vampire hunters were said to have also refused to reveal the cure of the disease in fear that if a cure was revealed, many thrill seekers would deliberately infect themselves. This could be the same route that the temple went with to ban this book. Volume 2 also states the scholarly inquiry upon the origin of vampirism is discouraged by the temple, and that could just be limiting the potential chaos in the future. Or could it be to prevent the true terrors of the temple from being revealed? Before we continue, we'll need to cast the illusion spell of light to pave the way to the bottom of this iceberg. Dwemer Ghosts The Dwemer were a highly advanced race, inventing revolutionary machines and building elaborate underground cities. But mysteriously, during the Battle of Red Mountain, the Dwemer just vanished, with only their inventions left behind to tell their tale. But in Morrowind, the Dwemer actually make their sole appearance in an Elder Scrolls game. Ancestral ghosts can be found guarding numerous tombs scattered throughout Vardenfell. But if the entire Dwemer race did indeed disappear, why are there some spectres still remaining on Vardenfell? And why do they not appear anywhere else on Tamriel, at least where the other games portray, where there are remnants of Dwemer life? There isn't really any in-game explanation for these Dwemer ghosts, but that hasn't stopped many theories from being proposed. Carol de Goth proposed that Dwarven spectres are not really ghosts, but they are just projections recorded images of the Dwemer that once were. 
the Dwemer, with all their highly advanced technology, could definitely have created some sort of artificial consciousness to remain in their stead, even as lifelike as Radak Stungthums, an undead Dwemer weaponsmith who even converses with the Nerevere. What are you doing here? Leave an old spirit to his haunts. But this isn't the only logical explanation that these Dwemer spirits could be hiding. The Morrowind Dwemer ruins are mainly scattered around the Red Mountains, near where the Heart of Lorcan was. The Heart of Lorcan was a divine spark, a result of the shattering of Lorcan, the god of all mortals. His heart plummeted to Tamriel, and with it, many of his powers, locked in this magical stone. The Dwemer first discovered this stone, and they began building a new god, constructed by the chief architect Lord Cadnarak. And with this they extracted the divine power of the Lorcan Heart, with the belief that it would make the Dwemer race immortal. This ended up resulting in the War of the First Council, which climaxed in the Battle of the Red Mountain, with the war concluding, but also the disappearance of the Dwemer, and the destruction of the House Dagoth. One common answer for why these Spectre and Dwemer still remain is that they have perished before the disappearance of the Dwemer, so their spirits remained. But this still wouldn't exactly explain why we do not see any Dwemer ghosts throughout Skyrim. Illitaris believes that these Dwemer ghosts were in some sort of way connected to the Heart of Lorcan. Because of the Nerevere, at the conclusion of Morrowind, the Heart of Lorcan seemingly vanished from Tamriel, so perhaps the Dwemer Spectres did as well. But the Dwemer ghosts aren't exactly the only remains of the Dwemer that could be seen throughout Morrowind. In the Dwemer ruin located under Mournhold, the ashes of individuals can be found and it looks like they've been vaporised in the midst of their everyday life. And it seems like two Dwemer must have had a very interesting daily life. Maybe not so much the peeping Tom Dwemer outside their doorway. But if the Dwemer did mysteriously disappear, then why are there piles of ashes left behind? Were they in fact instantly killed, changed to dust? Maybe yet again, something happened to this Dwemer before the Great Disappearance, as there are no ashes found anywhere else in Tamriel. In fact, the ashes only appear in the Tribunal expansion of Morrowind, and as Treacletop3826 points out, it means that it could just be an oversight of the DLC. Many writers from Morrowind were not part of the Tribunal. Baladus Dimonvani, a Dark Elf sorcerer who takes a great interest in the Dwemer, mentions that, As the Dwemer left no corpses or traces of conflict behind, I believe that generations of ritualistic anti-creations resulted in their immediate but foreseen removal from the Mundus. Maybe you just didn't see the ashes, or maybe those ashes aren't Dwemer after all. So what really happened to the Dwemer? Did they just die? Or did they truly disappear? While we have been saying that the entire Dwemer race is left without a trace, that isn't entirely true. Yagrim Bagarim, a master crafter who once served the chief Dwemer architect Lord Kagnari, is the last living dwarf during the events of Morrowind and he too ponders on the disappearance of the dwarves. Hmm, I cannot say what happened. I was not here to observe. I was in an outer realm at the time, and when I came back, my people were gone. I left Red Mountain wandering Tamriel for years, searching our deserted colonies, looking for a survivor or an explanation. Then a long, long time ago, I returned to Red Mountain, still looking for answers. Instead, found corpus disease, and I've been here ever since. I have theories if you are interested. Yagrim can help uncover the mystery of the dwarves through the deciphering of an ancient Dwemer text, with one of great value being the Egg of Time. The Egg of Time is a book of random Dwemer letters, coupled with images with what looks like instructions on how to use the Lochran's heart. Unfortunately, when the letters are deciphered to English, the words seem to be meaningless, but Yagrim can at least briefly explain the book's intentions. The Dwemer were not unified in their thinking. Kagranak and his tonal architects, among them with one Mazank, believed they could improve the Dwemer race. Others argued that the attempt would be too great a risk. Although this book argues that nothing disastrous could result, the disappearances of my race argues otherwise. So if Bethund agrees with Kagnarak with the use of Lochran's heart, could the Egg of Time be a reference to Kagnarak's intentions, and what has happened to the Dwemer? This could be explained by one theory on what happened to the Dwemer, and that's that they achieved zero sum. Elder Scrolls writer Michael Kirkbride has written many texts, both official and unofficial, 
often explaining many questions that arise in the Elder Scroll games. In the unofficial text of Vex teaching, a state called Kim is described where one escapes all laws of the defined world, breaking free of the world egg. It's believed that individuals such as Talos, and more appropriately Vivek, achieved Kim, with Vivek spreading his knowledge through his 36 lessons. To break free from the world, one must understand that you are part of a dream by some unknown godhead, and through this they can become gods, being able to control the dream. However, if the realisation occurs to beings that are not strong enough, they suffer zero sum, because they can't understand that if everything is a dream, how they themselves can exist. This zero summing results in them blinking out of existence, like the unnamed moth priest in the unofficial text Eat the Dreamer. Cyclonus 11 does not believe that the Dwemer race was zero summed. The zero sum the Dwemer would mean not only to make them disappear, but all evidence of their existence to also disappear. So if they were zero summed, there should be no Dwemer ruins or even Yagrim Bagan, even though he was in another realm. An example of zero summing is in Mythic Dawn Commentaries 3, where it mentions that Talos, through Kim, reshaped the land of Cyrodiil, the home of the Red King, to no longer be jungle. When we see Cyrodiil in Oblivion, we can see that the land is a temperate climate, and not a jungle, which means that Kim at least changed the future. Provinces of Tamriel describe Cyrodiil as the largest region of the continent, with most of it being a jungle. The provinces of Tamriel was first found in Morrowind, so we can assume that during the time of Morrowind, that Cyrodiil was in fact a jungle. However, in Elder Scrolls Online, which is set almost 300 years before Tiber Septim was even born, Cyrodiil is once again a temperate climate. Could it be because of Zero Summing, there will be and was never any jungles in Cyrodiil? But funnily enough, the provinces of Tamriel also exist in Oblivion, which still describes Cyrodiil as a jungle, even though it's clearly not. So is Zero Summing actually removing every memory and event? I'm not too sure. So maybe we can't discount Zero Summing as to the theory of why the Dwemer disappeared. Dover of the North reaffirms that perhaps Kagranak managed to access the divine power of the Heart of Lorcan, but it revealed the truth of the dream to the Dwemer in the realm, causing them to zero sum and vanish from Tamriel. I feel like zero summing and Kim are to help explain retcons in a law friendly way, so if this theory was correct from the Dwemer, I would be quite disappointed in its creativity, almost as if it's sweeping the mystery under the rug. But this isn't the only theory of how the Dwemer disappeared. Another of the more obscure theories for what happened to the Dwemer is that their combined souls became the skin of the Numidium, the Dwemer's brass god. This theory stretches all the way back to 1999, where developers from Morrowind were being interviewed before the release of the third Elder Scrolls game. An interview by the Skeleton Man was conducted to know more about Morrowind's culture. Within the interview was one particular question, asking to shed more light upon the supposed brass god that the Dwemer were building. In character, the human Rurikati Zal responded, Ah, I will tell you the truth, because you will believe none of it. The Brass God is Animidum, the Prime Gestalt. He is also called the Divine Skin. He is meant to be used many times by our kind to transcend the Grey, maybe. This led many to believe that the God that the Dwemer were creating required the Dwemer to be their skin. The wearing of a skin is a recurring theme in Morrowind. In the anticipations, the followers of Boethia and Tranimac rub the soil of Tranimac upon themselves, changing their skin, paving the way for them to become the changed ones. This wearing of the skin changed the host's ideology, so if the Dwemer were actually a part of the Numidium skin, then the god would be wearing the skin of the Dwemer, morphing their god into the Dwemer god. Numidian was meant to be powered by the heart of Lorca, so he could essentially be controlled by the skin. But the skeleton interview doesn't seem as clear cut that all of the Dwemer became the skin. Kakranak was devoted to his people, and the dwarves, despite what you may have read, were a pious lot. He would not have sacrificed so many of their golden souls to create Animidum's metal body if it were all in the name of Grand Theatre. Maybe this doesn't say all because of Yagra, the one outlier. Feed mentions one outlier in this text that often gets overlooked, that the Dwemer's souls are referred to as golden. Souls in Elder Scrolls are divided into two colours. White souls are the souls of non-sentient creatures, including the Thalma, which we discussed in our earlier Skyrim Iceberg video. And black souls are the souls of sentient beings, being larger than that of white souls. 
but the Dwemer here were mentioned as having golden souls. It seems quite odd, as you would presume the Dwemer would have black souls, like all of the other sentient races. Starlet Seafoam suggests that maybe like how the Dwemer could have extracted part of the Falmer's soul to make them white. Perhaps the souls could have been enhanced, making them go from black to golden. Or maybe this was just poetic freedom, and we shouldn't take this literally. But could that reasoning extend as far as the divine skin? It's also important to know that the concept of black and white souls were not introduced until the next game of Oblivion, so perhaps if this interview was conducted again today, the answer would be different. I think the true meaning for why the Dwemer disappeared will unfortunately always remain a mystery. It could be a much more simpler answer that either the Dwemer were completely destroyed, or they all ascended into another realm, like Yagrim intended. But I think the absence of Dwemer ghosts after the game of Morrowind is primarily to increase the mysticism around an almost alien civilization, one that would be immediately brought down to Earth if you could converse with a blacksmith at the time. These points of discussion are getting more and more conceptual to a realm of realization that isn't that tangible. Yet we must believe and achieve the Kim layer of this iceberg. A lot of these mind warping thoughts are weaved and spawned through one of the most absorbing literature in the Morrowind universe, perhaps even all video games. The 36 Lessons of Vivek are books that are scattered around islands of Vardenfell, containing the elaborate musings of Vivek. A fantastical story containing facts and fictions, truth and lies, with the lies just being theoretical inspiration. But the lessons at least provide an insight into the life of Vivek, even though it's written by an unreliable narrator, probing the deep ideas that lie at the base of the Elder Scrolls universe, and parallel the inspired mind of Michael Kirkbride. Vivek is Kirkbride's masterpiece, his favourite character, so his own bias would have rubbed off into Vivek's stories as well. These lessons also contain many secret messages. The first letter of every word in Sermon 36 spells foul murder. At Morrowind's 10th anniversary, Michael Kirkbride released an illustration titled Foul Murder, which depicts the tribunal, Vivek, Almalexia, and Sotha Sil murdering the Nerevar. Indiril Nerevar was a fabled champion of the First Era who led the Dunmar to rise up against the Dwemer in the War of the First Council, but mentionings of this is quite vague. The Daedric Prince Azura swore to resurrect Nerevar, which led to the Nerevarian prophecy, which the tribunal denounced as heresy. But this prophecy was fulfilled come the protagonist of Morrowind, the Nerevarine, with the conditions of the ancient prophecy met. Imperial Guard Celis Gravius gives the Nerevarine a package at the beginning of Morrowind, which contains a coded message, encrypted using Viganir cipher, which uses a series of Caesar ciphers interwoven with each other to shift letters multiple times. When decrypted, this package details that the Nerevarian was actually handpicked by the Emperor, and encouraged to meet their prophecy, on the chance that if the conspiracy was true, the Nerevarian would be a ranking member of the Blades and become an agent of the Empire. The prophecy of the Nerevarian was to tear down false gods of Morrowind, so the Imperials could have seen this as a move to destabilise the Tribunal, which had been a constant thorn in the side of the Septim Empire. But did that Tribunal really kill Nerevar? Claimed to be Vivek, also known as Vex, last known presence before his appearance, the forum roleplay The Trial of Vivek depicted the Tribunal being tried for the alleged murder of Lord Nerevar, as Vek and Vek I hereby answer, my right and my left with black hands. Vek the mortal did murder the Hortatar, Vek the god did not, and remained as written, and yet those two are the same being, and yet are not, save for one red moment. Know that the water face do I answer, so I cannot be made to lie. Although this yet again is not truly canon, the roleplay contained many developers of Elder Scrolls, so there might be a grain of truth to it. Vivek the mortal did murder the teacher, Horthor, Nerevar, but when he became god, he changed to another being so freed himself from his past. Sermon 29 of Vivek also contains a secret message, where each number would correspond to a word within his respective sermon. This revealed the message, he was not born a god, his destiny did not lead him to this crime. He chose this path of his own free will. He stole the godhead and murdered the Hortador. Vivek wrote this. It seems like Vivek is admitting to the murder of the Nerevar. Nerevar at the Red Mountain details that the tribunal made a ritual to summon Nerevar's guide Azura, but this was just a cloud of deceit. Almalexia used poison candles, 
So the Sil used poison robes. And Vivek used poison invocations. The Nerevar was murdered. The B Stample 1 raises a very good point about this depiction. The Nerevar at the Red Mountain also states that Dagoth Ur was at the Heart Chamber, remaining with the tools that tapped into the divine power. This was during the time that the Nerevar goes to confer with the Tribunal and gets murdered. But Kirkbride's drawing depicts Dagoth Ur at the site of the murder, being forced into the dirt after secretly obtaining the mass altering abilities of Kagranak's tools. It seems that the accounts of the Nerevar's murder might not be as clear cut as we can know. Interestingly though, the Nerevar at Red Mountain also describes how when the tools separated the power of the heart from the Dwemer people, the Dwemer turned into dust all around them as their stolen immortality was taken away. Perhaps this could be an explanation for the ash piles found in the Tribunal expansion. But these didn't appear in any battlegrounds. But there are many contradictions. The Battle of Red Mountain, written by Vivek, claims that Nerevar collapsed from grievous wounds inflicted by Dumak, the Dwarf King, with Dwemer everywhere disappearing without trace. In fact, there's reasoning to believe that even Shaw, the Nordic representation of the god Lorcan, killed the Nerevar. With his heart being there, he could have caused the demise of the Nerevar. Even Dagoth Ur, through his deceit and greed, could have been the end of the Nerevar. Mortazo believes that in fact all of these accounts are true, even though different. These murders could have happened in separate timelines, due to a phenomenon known as the Dragon Break. This is known as the Dragon Break as it references the Dragon Akatosh, the Dragon God of Time. Time is ordered because Akatosh wills it so. But at times, primarily when Akatosh is meddled with, time becomes realigned, making the continuity of reality impossible. This was used to explain the events of Daggerfall, where the conclusion of the game resulted in many endings. With so many different endings, Bethesda didn't want to decide what event would truly be the actual events of history, invalidating many other players' choices. So the concept of a dragon break was introduced where all possible endings happened. Valdrun is one of the more learned examiners of the Dragon Break within the Elder Scrolls universe, yet in his studies, he believes the Dragon Break was invented in the late Third Era, and was fueled by many scholars performing errors due to their obsession with the Dwemer Brass God, along with the idea of an afterlife. During the Battle of the Red Mountain, an event happened known as the Red Moment. Like Mortazo suggests, it's possible that this was actually a Dragon Break, being catalyzed by the Nemidium. Found in Elder Scrolls Online as an addition to the 36 lessons, Vivek's Sermon 37 describes a red moment as a great howling unchecked. Could this be the unchecked reveling of time? Maybe the egg of time is a reference to the disruption of time that occurred. Like the reasoning with Daggerfall, I don't think we will get an absolute reason for many mysteries in Morrowind. Who killed the Nerevar? What happened to the Dwemer? because I believe that Bethesda will be leaving these mysteries to be concluded by us. It's whatever we choose to believe, whatever is canon in our mind, because everything could be true. Or maybe everything is not. A lot of these points are cladded with unofficial texts written by an ex-writer's amazing passion, so it's very hard to clearly unweave the narrative and decide what is actually in Elder Scrolls and what is not. And it will be interesting to see how they manage to tie in all of Elder Scrolls Online massive lore into the next major Elder Scrolls game. Perhaps Elder Scrolls Online itself isn't a dragon break, but that's a discussion for another time. But for now, let's disappear from this realm and complete our observation of the Morrowind Iceberg. I hope all of our brains have remained intact because this was quite a mind-boggling adventure. If you would like to go even deeper into Morrowind lore, I suggest reading texts from the Imperial Library, both official and unofficial texts. Thank you for making it to the end of this video, and please let me know your thoughts on the discussions that we've had, or to bring up points that we've missed. Hopefully we'll meet again for some more analysis in the amazing worlds that video games hold.